Welcome everyone. My name is Penny Wyatt and I am the Director of Family Programs here at Tulane University. We're very glad that you've joined us today for this webinar, Alcohol and Other Substances, Prevention, Education, Intervention, and Recovery. Um, some of you um, may have joined us for a webinar we held this past summer for the parents of incoming first year students that had a similar title. I and mean, it was part of our Tulane Talks series where we were trying to give parents some information before their students arrived on campus to have some important conversations before they arrive. Um, but today's webinar is, has a little bit different goal. We want to um, provide this opportunity now that the semester you know, is about two thirds of the way through, you may have had some conversations with your students since then, or they've had some concrete experiences or perhaps some challenges around these issues that are prompting more specific questions from you. You'd like to know more about particular resources. So our goal today is to keep the formal presentation a bit shorter than that other webinar. If you want to go back and review that content, it is available on the, the website for family programs under the communications tab in our webinar archive. But today we hope that we can provide sort of a baseline of information and then let your questions drive the conversation. So we do ask that you hold those questions until we prompt you, and then you'll type those in into the, the Q&A feature on your screen. And then um, we'll start taking those questions at that time. So we'll let you know when it's time to enter those. Um, it does help us be a little bit more efficient with those questions if you can hold them until we, we prompt you. So I um, would also just like to remind you that in a few days, you know, give us maybe four business days or so, and then the webinar recording will also be available on our website. So I am very um, happy to introduce to you um, our panelists for today. And they come from these different offices on campus, but we'll let each of them um, introduce themselves to you and then we'll get started. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jacob Goldberg. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed addictions counselor, and I'm in charge of our recovery community at Tulane. I'm housed in campus health. So I'll, uh, I have more to say, but I'll pass it over to my colleague, Chelsea, to introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chelsea Reed, and I might be a new face to some of you because I'm a relatively um, new professional here at Tulane. Um, I am the Associate Director of the Well for Health Promotion. I come to Tulane after 10 years of working in student affairs and in public health, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to connect with you all today. And good afternoon. My name is Dr. Zakarda. I'm the Director of Student Conduct at Tulane. I've been at Tulane for about five years, and I am part of the Dean of Students Office. So again, I'll be moderating the question part at the end, and I'll turn things over to them and rejoin you at that point. Thanks, Penny. I guess I get to introduce myself again. Here we go, because I have a picture of myself on the slide. Uh, first of all, I just want to extend my gratitude for everybody and their time. Um, I've been working, serving the university for about three years now, and I, before that, I've worked with emerging adults and their families with mental health, substance use issues, and a, very, a variety of medical settings for about 15 years. Um, but again, like Penny said, our aim is really to give a brief overview of all the resources and supports that we, um, we have and what we're doing on campus, but really extend an opportunity for you all to, to share some of your experiences or ask some questions where we can maybe fill some of those gaps. Um, we understand that this is a very comprehensive um, issue and subject area that we care deeply about, and we're very dedicated to supporting and helping and guiding our Tulane community as a whole. Um, I also would just want to recognize the collaboration sp specifically on this panel. Uh, we have uh, representatives from different areas of the university um, which to help support our students. Um, and I can say that this is this is not the norm on all college campuses. Uh, rarely do we have uh, prevention folks and providers sitting with our director of conduct 
um, as well to sit here and support uh, collaborative experiences to help support our students and rather get away from a, a punitive or consequential uh, place. So I just wanted to take the time to acknowledge that and real grateful that Dr. Zicarda is here and works works with our offices. Um, so uh, you can give me the, here's some information on these on the screen. We'll flash this later, but um, I always like to share my contacts as my direct cell phone number as well. Uh, family members do reach out to me, uh, students do reach out to me, and that's the best way to get a hold of me. So um, hopefully you can you can access that later if necessary. Uh, Penny, if you don't mind, you can go to the to the next slide. So a little bit about the Tulane Recovery Community. We are a uh, recovery support program. These exist on college campuses. There's about 150 other schools that have some sort of recovery supports. Um, some of the things that we provide, we have uh, weekly recovery meetings. Um, we have about three meetings a week right now, um, and we're hoping to expand those uh, supports on campus. Um, we do uh, monthly social activities that are alternative programming uh, to support our students in recovery, to so support students that are just trying to do something different or have a different relationship with substances or alcohol. Um, you know, this past month in November, we had a sober uh, a comedy event that we hosted in the LBC. Uh, there was a large sober festival that happened in New Orleans at Mardi Gras World that we sent students to. Uh, last week, last last month in, in October, we did uh, we went to a rodeo and we did an outdoor adventure trip. In September, we took 25 students um, to the International Conference for Young People in AA, which was in New Orleans this year. Um, and uh, next next month, uh, the students are excited about going to a Renaissance Fest with another school in um, in Hammond, Louisiana, um, to have some opportunities for fellowship. So we really try to offer um, a, a plethora of different opportunities for students to engage in, in something different um, than uh, maybe going out and focusing on getting intoxicated or using substances. Um, we do recovery education. We, my office also covers our early intervention strategy. So basics, um, which is brief alcohol screening interve uh, interventions for college students consists of two 50 minute sessions with one of my graduate students. Um, and a, a validated self-report survey. So the aim is to help with um, some under understanding around substance um, and maybe some alternatives to, um, to their consumption, take a look at some harm reduction strategies or get into some, some abstinence-based support. Uh, my office also collaborates with the counseling center and we have a direct therapist there um, that we can get folks uh, connected to specifically around substance use um, and any other problematic uh, relationships. So um, again, we, uh, we also help connect peers to peers. That's a, a big piece. Um, a lot of times students want to hear from their peers, not from um, the older boomer like myself sitting here talking to you guys. So we, uh, we want, we would like to help uh, get students connected to the right folks, um, someone that some of their peers that they may be able to be a little more um, open with and feel comfortable talking to and hopefully get to, to the right resources. Uh, exciting news for the recovery community too that I get to share with when all these, uh, any opportunity I can is that we are um, moving forward with our recovery community house project, which will be online sometime next next year. Uh, will serve as a more of a dedicated space to offer different types of programming for students, social opportunities, drop-in space, and eventually we'll have recovery housing there as well. Um, so a lot of great um, initiatives that are happening along those fronts to help support our students along the continuum of substance use. Um, and yeah, I think that, that I, I can sit here and talk to you a little bit more about us, but I want to um, leave the space for my colleagues to share and, of course, hear from, from y'all and y'all's experiences and where we may be able to help. So thank you for the time, and I will pass it on to Chelsea, um, and we can move to the next slide, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. So as I had the opportunity to share a moment ago, my name is Chelsea Reed, and I am the Associate Director for the Well for Health Promotion. And I feel like our title is a little bit nebulous, so I'm going to start by explaining what our office actually does for the campus community. So the Well for Health Promotion, as the title suggests, we provide 
Health Promotion Services, which is kind of a part of um, the spectrum of public health care, if you will. So most of our time, most of our programming, our workshops, our resources, our educational efforts, all the different ways we do the work that we do, most of that is dedicated to preventative wellness, which of course prevention can happen at, at different levels. Um, but we're trying to equip our students and really our, our kind of call in our whole campus community with resources and knowledge that allow them to support themselves as throughout kind of a holistic spectrum of health and well-being, right? And one of the ways we do that is by ensuring we have um, kind of core content areas that may be particularly relevant to um, this particular traditional under a or excuse me traditional undergraduate demographic um, age demographic. Um, so we have got professionals on our team that are dedicated to topics like sexual health. They're dedicated to topics like sexual violence prevention, mental health and well-being, and of course, as relevant to our current conversation today, alcohol and other drugs. Um, and our whole team functions collaboratively, often co-programming together so that we can talk about these health outcomes um, kind of you know, independently, but then also at points where they might intersect um, or where they may manifest together um, as a person might experience them throughout the course of not only their time as a student, but throughout their lifetime. So in short, we basically do a bunch of different programs and services that are dedicated to preventative health and well-being. And we work with our undergraduate uh, students, but I do also want to mention that we do work with graduate and professional students as well. Um, I'm excited to hear from you all here in a moment. So I'm not sure exactly who all might be joining us today, but I do want to acknowledge that we do these same services in these same topical areas also for graduate and professional students. Next slide, please. So talking specifically about our core content area of alcohol and other drugs, and just, you know, it wouldn't be a higher ed conversation if we didn't have some good acronym use on board. You might hear me um, truncate that to AOD. Um, I'll try to be mindful of that as, as we're going throughout our time together today. But to give you an idea of what some of our AOD or alcohol and other drug programming looks like, um, we're starting some new initiatives this year where we're really trying to acknowledge that for some folks, there might be times and spaces where they do have interactions with substances. And can we acknowledge and gently normalize that so that we can open the door to create spaces where students feel safe, raising their hand and asking questions that they might not have the answers to and asking those questions from um, professionals, also from peer health educators, which we'll talk about um, in a moment, and then also knowing that they can access some of the, the information they're seeking through different online or virtual um, portals. So creating different opportunities for students to get accurate, reliable information um, on a topic that might be somewhat taboo or might be somewhat difficult to talk about, right? So these are kind of some of our larger initiatives, larger programs we're working on throughout the current academic year to start opening the door, really continuing to open the door, continue these conversations, because um, a lot of this good foundational work has um, been done, was, was done before my arrival at Tulane in May. Um, a lot of our programming is also working on resource awareness. Um, so at Tulane, we have a lot of different and wonderful resources, offices, professionals, opportunities for connections. Um, and a part of what we do is actually educate the um, campus community about what those resources are and how do how do I make an appointment at the student health center or how do I get connected with Jacob if I want to learn more about the recovery community. So you can see here we also do a lot of resource awareness and connection and specifically under AOD education we do a lot of what I call just basic alcohol and other drug information. So making sure our campus community, again, has reliable, accurate information that they can ask in kind of a safe and, and validated place. One of the ways we do that is through a program called Live Well. Um, Live Well is a program that's been here at Tulane um, for quite a while. Um, we spent a lot of time this summer really updating it, making sure it's meeting our students where they are now in this, for lack of better language, post-COVID world, 
Um, and we were able to offer it um, kind of as a part of our standing orientation programming. And that was something that our office facilitated. So on the next slide, I've got some information that's a little more specific, definitely text heavy, um, but this is a little more specifically what our office has been doing this current semester um, when we start talking about alcohol and other drugs. So throughout the last academic year, we were able to do a certain amount of in-person programming. This year, we've been able to really safely bring that back on board, of course, always adhering um, to our uh, campus health centers community guidelines, depending upon what might be happening in the world at large. Um, but we've been able to bring our programs back online. But because over the last two academic years, all of our educational programs have been virtually adapted, we've been able to offer those still as needed and as requested. Um, we've introduced some residence hall based adaptations of our um, AOD workshops, namely one that's called The Buzz, um, which is basically some alcohol 101 education. Um, and we've also begun a new um, series with our athletics department. And one thing that's really exciting is by the end of, the sp of spring 2023, every student athlete will have actually had the opportunity to go through this program. Um, we've collaborated with them in the past, but this kind of comprehensive approach is a new approach. So we're really excited about that, grateful for that partnership. Um, and a moment ago, as I finish up, you heard me mention our peer health educators. Um, I'm also the staff advisor for the Tufts, the Tulane University peer health educators. They are all NASPA certified peer health educators. So these are students that have dedicated specific training in facilitation, in, um, in, in providing students with kind of warm handoffs and resource connectivity. Um, they go through dedicated training for that. This semester, we had um, a really competitive um, applicant pool, and we were able to add 20 additional Tufts to our current cohort. So we're now sitting at 53 um, certified peer health educators for our campus community. And the numbers you see there, those are all student-led exchanges. And again, to echo Jacob's point, that's really important because as fascinating as I might be um, to an 18 to 22 year old, I at 34 years old, am old. And there are certain things that I just simply may not be able to relate relate to them on, right? Um, so having their peers who are trained, um, who are informed, and who are connected and know when to, um, you know, maybe refer to professional staff, that creates a really valuable education point for students. Again, especially when we're talking about health outcomes that are maybe difficult to talk about or sometimes somewhat taboo still. So our students this semester, um, have reached 271 students throughout their workshop efforts and throughout their Live Well Hut, which is their general health and well-being outreach services, they were able to reach um, 624 individuals. So really proud of the robust programming that not only our professional staff has pulled together um, so far this year, but also the work that our peer health educators um, are leading. So next slide, please. Yeah, and this is just a screen um, just to give you an idea of how accessible our workshops are, um, student groups and fraternities, sororities, all different kinds of organizations across campus reach out to us through this portal. So um, with all of that said, I will contain my enthusiasm and I will pass it over to Dr. Zicarda. All right. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, and if you're old, then I must be ancient to them. So, you know, thank you for that setup. So again, as part of the, the Dean of Students Office, my office, the Office of Student Conduct, as well as my sister office, the Office of Case Management and Victim Support Services, we help students reflect on and explore the choices that may, they make, helping them make healthy choices, but then also having them reflect on what could be the consequences or impacts to their own educational experience or that of their communities, whether it's a residential community the community of New Orleans or even greater communities at large, so they can understand the impacts that their choices and their behaviors are having on those communities. And so in terms of prevention, one of the ways that the Office of Student Conduct helps with that is making sure that our expectations the university has for our students are clear. And we do that through our code of student conduct. And it is a fascinating, super quick 61 page read that outlines 
both the behavioral expectations and the processes by which we would explore the adjudication if there is a violation of that. And so you can see some of these websites on the screen uh, will include links to our code of student conduct. One of the initiatives that we've been partnering with a few offices is our initiative called Know the Code. And so the idea is that we want all members of the Tulane community, the Tulane family, including our students and their families, to make sure that they know that code of student conduct so that the behavioral expectations are clear. There is research that supports that if students have a sense of what their expectations are, they're more likely to live up to those expectations, or at least be cognizant of what the expectations are as they're making those choices. So the code of student conduct, as I said, it outlines our behavioral expectations. It applies to all students. So whether that's our residential students living in the residence halls, or those students that live off campus, or those students that are online students, or those students that are in our graduate programs, professional programs like law school uh, or the med school, or even part-time, regardless of, of program, they all fall under, they're all a part of the code of student conduct and expected to abide by those expectations. That also includes during summer and so, and other breaks. So once you're a Tulane student, you're a Tulane student until you're not a Tulane student. And that usually happens with graduation. <clears throat> the other thing that I'll share is the behavioral expectations also apply equally on and off campus. And that often surprises students to learn that the code of student conduct that they have agreed to, they have agreed to abide by the tenets of that code, apply equally, whether it's in a residence hall or in a classroom, but just as equally to if they're at an off-campus party uh, at an off-campus apartment or a fraternity house, for instance, or if they're at a bar downtown, or if they're in the quarter, or if they're studying abroad. The location is irrelevant. The code of student conduct applies equally. The other area where I think the Office of Student Conduct is involved with this prevention, education, and intervention in particular is when there is a report of possible misconduct, that student will meet with a hearing officer. So someone from my staff or a hearing officer that is trained by my staff that also works in housing and residence life. And that educational intervention and, and that educational process that a student will go through encourages them to explore, again, the choices that they're making, what led to those choices, and what are the impacts for their own educational experience and the experience of their peers or other community members that they're having. And so at times there may be some learning outcomes or other educational outcomes that could include things like sanctions. And those sanctions could include a policy review, making sure that they're going to demonstrate a thorough understanding of what our expectations are. That policy review could be about the drug or alcohol policy. There could be some other intervention type uh, outcomes like as Jacob mentioned, basics or e-checkup. Those are very common educational outcomes for an intervention when there is a, a finding of responsibility for a violation. There may be times where through the course of the, of the conduct process, the hearing officer has reason to believe that this individual could benefit from some sort of assessment. And so we have been a great partner with Jacob in, in connecting that student that perhaps needs some support with Jacob and some of his colleagues to do an assessment, a, a drug or alcohol assessment to explore alcohol use or misuse or substance abuse uh, and, and outline a treatment and a plan to support that student so that he, she, or they is, is in a position where they can succeed. Uh, another element that we can sometimes add to that, and these, again, not in every instance, but in some instances where it seems warranted, is we do partner with Jacob's office uh, in, in some testing. So there may be students that are going through some random drug or alcohol testing as a way to help keep them uh, on that path of, of making good choices, making healthy choices. Uh, and then the last thing that I, I think that the Office of Student Conduct may do as it relates to the conduct process itself, is there may be some status changes. So if a student is found responsible for a more serious violation of our code of student conduct, they could be facing what's called disciplinary probation. And that probation, the way I explain it to students is, it's a really specific set of guide rails that will keep them from making future 
uh, dangerous or negative or unhealthy choices that would land them back in the Office of Student Conduct or meeting with another hearing officer. And so those protective limit setting disciplinary probation guidelines are a really harsh reminder at times to the student that's, that says the choices that you're making going forward need to make sure that they're in compliance with our behavioral expectations. One question that I do often get and, and I wanna bring your attention to, again, you can see the link on the screen, is the conduct process also recognizes that students may be exploring using drugs or alcohol, and, and we don't want a situation where a student is now afraid to get the help that they need or to help somebody else that is in danger. And so, for instance, if there is a student that has had too much to drink uh, and there's other students that are worried about, about that student, the friends could call an RA, could call a representative from campus police or another representative from housing and residence life. And instead of going through that formal conduct process that may feel a little bit disciplinary in nature, even though it certainly has its restorative and educational components to it, instead that student will meet with a case manager, that student will meet with somebody that is gonna help them explore what are the choices that led to this transport or this, this evaluation and more specifically, what are the interventions that are going to be put in place so that we can protect that student from any future danger? And so that amnesty policy, again, is when students are, when they're actively seeking out help, either on their own behalf or on behalf of somebody else, um, again, that conduct process is, is waived. And so I think that's it for the conduct portion of, of today's presentation. So Penny, I think I turn it back to you, right? Yes. So um, parents and family members, this is the time to submit your questions. Um, I, because there were a few people who joined us late, I'll just repeat um, that our practice is to um, post the PDF of the slides and the recording of the webinar on the Family Programs website. So you just go to families dot tulane.edu, look in the communications section, and there's a um, webinar archive there. So we're waiting for questions to be submitted. So um, I encourage you to submit those um, now. I'm not seeing anything yet. So, um, so we'll just wait to see if you have any questions. Um, or I'll turn it over to panelists in case there's something that you forgot or you wanted to um, elaborate on, we can do a little bit of that while we're waiting. I just challenge parents or families to stump Jacob. So here's here's a good question. Where should a student go if they worry that they have a problem, that they might have a problem with alcohol or drugs? What would be points I'll, of- I'll, I could jump in for that and my colleagues can, can answer it as well. I think there's really, uh, the university is 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 created a space where the student can go to many places if they feel like they're having uh, there's not one specific uh, individual. Of course, uh, my office uh, contacting me is always open and available for someone to come and, and speak to. Um, it's also a confidential space, um, so that's um, covered under HIPAA and being housed in campus health. So that um, leaves leaves some confidentiality there. But we have students that um, disclose if they're in a residence hall, we have students that talk to their RAs, we have students that go and talk to professors, we have students that talk to other staff members, it could be another provider in the campus health, could be their counseling, could be someone in the counseling center, it could be someone that comes up in case management, or it comes up it, within the conduct process or through um, through maybe academic coaching or through some success success coaching and and uh, the great as we are so well resourced here at Tulane that um, our folks on campus do know where to get people connected if they're willing um, to talk to someone else so um, we uh, we have partnership with and why what, what we're doing right here why we have partnership with collaborative um, offices on campus to help um, get funnel students to the right place. If um, for whatever their specific needs are. Again, as I began this presentation, I think around substance use and alcohol use, it's, um, it's, a, it's a complicated space and it, it moves around and, and people vacillate in different areas. So 
we want to try to be meet the student exactly where they're at and respond very quickly for supports. Another opportunity for folks is through concern, if they if through the concern reporting process. Uh, that can be done anonymously. Um, it can be named specifically as well, too. But um, I specifically, I, 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 I meet with students and their peers. Um, I've had peers that um, are concerned about um, another peer and said, hey, can we um, schedule a meeting? Can we Zoom? Can we meet in person? Absolutely. Um, I'm also available to meet outside of the health center if folks are, um, have, if there is a barrier there. And then, of course, we can get folks um, to off-campus resources again if they if they would feel more comfortable in that in that space. Um, so uh, feel free if anybody else want if I missed anything, people can jump in for other ways people can get connected. So um, here's a question: um, One parent said that their student denies that there's a problem, but the the family members is are the parents are suspicious that there's a problem going on. What would you recommend in that case, Jacob or, or anybody else? Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty normal too, I would say that um, oftentimes with substance use, especially early interventions with folks, it's, off time, it's externally motivated. Um, there can be uh, a lot of defense mechanisms that come up or just um, also just the, the judgment or insight is it there for the young person to be able to recognize the significance of, of maybe the trajectory that they're going on or maybe some of the environment that they're in. Um, and it, it really takes um, the, and the entire support system sometimes to intervene on a student to be take, take the opportunity to consider um, taking a look at maybe their relationship with substances or alcohol or other, other problematic behaviors. One of the interventions um, and, and really that we named earlier, basics, um, really speaks to that because it's an opportunity to meet with another a peer, a student that's trained in motivational interviewing. And motivational interviewing um, is a great, uh, it's, it's the best practice for dealing with substance use because it really meets people with their, where that is defenses come up and the resistance and rather than challenging folks. Um, you know, it, it, it can be helpful. Sometimes it, uh, it takes a little time for folks to be able to move through the stages of change move from a pre-contemplative state to even considering that maybe they have um, an issue of some sort. Um, now, granted, if it's a safety concern or if the significance of, um, of someone's um, um, consequences are being elevated, we would want to elevate the intervention and move, move quicker in those capacities. And, and we have those. And again, reaching out through the concern reporting, speaking with your student is really helpful. Um, try to have that intervention. And I think that um, my office, at least I'm available to, to work with parents and students um, to interface in, some, in those ways and would be happy to have a conversation in any capacity offline. Um, anybody else can respond to that too. Chris is making me answer all the questions. Jacob, would you um, explain what the acronym BASIC stands for again? Yes, absolutely. It is Brief Alcohol Screening Intervention for College Students. So anybody can sign up for that. We have on our on our website, uh, the student can sign themselves up for it and they receive, um, so they will receive a, a survey um, in their email. It's um, used one of uh, a few validated tools like audit um, that look at um, their consumption. And again, it's all self-report. So, excuse me, um, you know, there there is some, there is that nuance there. They will um, fill out this survey, and then that survey will be generated and given to one of to, to my office. And we disperse one of our graduate uh, assistants to to meet with them and start to begin that conversation. Um, and uh, it's again, it's a great entry level intervention that's pretty much used universally across college campuses um, for this specific subject matter. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions about vaping. How does Tulane address nicotine vaping? What are the rules in smoking in the residence halls? And um, one of the slides mentioned smoking cessation and their student vapes a lot, but doesn't know how to stop. Would the smoking cessation programming apply to them? And so I'll start with the first set of questions as, as it relates to the behavioral expectations, the rules. Uh, so all Tulane campus areas, properties, residence halls, academic buildings, green spaces, Anything that is de deemed a two-lane property, they are all smoke, nicotine, and vaping free. 
Uh, so students are prohibited from using any nicotine product uh, anywhere on campus and in the residence halls. Those students that live in the residence halls, they also sign a community living standards agreement that also outlines they are prohibited from vaping, from smoking in the residence halls. Uh, for, uh, for vaping in particular, in my observation, we don't get a lot of reports of students that are, are still smoking and vaping, vaping on campus. Uh, either it's because what we hope is that most students realize that they're, that that is prohibited on campus. That's not unusual. Tulane is certainly not alone in that sense. Um, or that they're, they're, if they are still using nicotine products or they are vaping, that they're doing it in social settings that are off campus, whether it's at or outside of certain bars or at off campus, off campus properties. But the number of reports of illegal nicotine and vaping use on campus is remarkably low. Thank you, Chris. Um, Chelsea, would you want to say anything else about the programming? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the smoking cessation kits that we do offer as a resource out of our office, they would absolutely be appropriate for somebody who's vaping as opposed to somebody who's smoking, say, a traditional cigarette. Um, and I also do want to share, too, that um, our Tulane University Campus Health Instagram, um, which by all the metrics that we use to track kind of, you know, population engagement, um, we know that our Instagram account is, is one of our more popular resources accessed by students. Um, we just this week were finalizing a harm reduction and vaping slide deck that um, is going to be updated and, and resourced there. So all that to say, we have actual physical resources. It's something um, that becomes a part of a lot of our educational programming that we're doing when we're having conversations with students. But then we're also putting that literature and information out there in a passive way. And that's really important to kind of highlight and underscore because kind of as we're acknowledging in this conversation, sometimes folks are raising their hand and they're like, hey, I need help. I need support. I, maybe I don't even know what the heck is going on, but I don't like the way my relationship with substance A, B, or C is manifesting. But also too, depending upon where they're at with their own journey and, and kind of with their own selves, they might be in a place where you know, they're just passively scrolling on their phone and then they say, oh, like I vape, here's like some information about vaping. And they might just casually scroll through. And even if they just learn one, one kind of action item, one step they could take, one adjustment, one opportunity that feels good to them, wherever they're at in that moment, that can kind of have a, a, a powerful impact moving forward. Um, and so I would also say to you, like, it is, of course, like normal to be concerned when we have people that we love, especially our children, you know, um, doing things that maybe give us concern or, or worry. Um, so, you know, anybody who's ever asked kind of, you know, my opinion about how, well, how do I navigate that conversation? It's absolutely acceptable to recommend resources, put it out there, and then have the trust, let it be. Because um, having respectful bi-directional conversation about health behaviors, especially about something so specific, um, is really important in terms of keeping that door open and keeping that communication flowing. Um, but all of that to say, um, if you're interested in letting your student know that they can come to the Well for Health Promotion or interact with our programming to get smoking cessation kits, we would be happy to give them those. I'd like to add as well, thank you for that, Chelsea, is that, you know, we, our providers in the health center are um, adept with working with um, smoking cessation programs as well. So, you know, we, we provide nicotine patches um, through the pharmacy. Um, there's other psychotropic medication that could be indicated for an individual who's trying to discontinue their use with nicotine. Um, and we also have students that will um, get connected with our counseling center, and that will be a their topic focus area is to to work on um, smoking sensation. So there are resources on campus, of course, um, from from a provider standpoint to to address that if if the student is willing to engage in those. Thank you. So here's another question. My son is interested in joining a fraternity. I'm particularly concerned about the combination of binge drinking and hazing. Has any extra attention been given? been given to this issue? 
Sure. And that is a, a legitimate concern. Uh, you know, I will I will share that the university has been working with the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Programs, working with our national offices to address those exact concerns. And what I can share with you, and I share this not only as the director of student conduct, but I also share this as a fraternity man himself, that the the extra attention that we're giving to both binge drinking within the fraternity and sorority system, as well as hazing, uh, has grown exponentially over the last several years. And I'm really proud of the work that the university and the resources that the university has put towards this. Just some of the examples that we include, uh, within the last three years, the university has developed an online course in which any student that is interested in joining a fraternity or sorority has to take this interactive course in which they're learning about our behavioral expectations, obviously, uh, but they're also learning about the legal consequences. They're learning about the both the mental and the physical toll that hazing can, can take on students. And they're learning uh, intervention techniques. They're learning how to intervene and or report when they worry that someone that themselves or someone else uh, is being hazed. The, the binge drinking piece, uh, I, while it's certainly not isolated to our fraternity and sorority community, and, and it would probably be too much of a generalization to say that all of our fraternities and sororities engage in, in, in some sort of binge drinking. Again, there is some, some, some evidence that does make those connections, and to help counter that as well, similar to the hazing prevention education, students that are about to join fraternities and sororities also go through some uh, binge drinking preventative education, not only before they join, but then once they join. So very frequently throughout their 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 duration of, of being a member of a fraternity or a sorority, they will bring in, maybe it's Chelsea's Tough uh, uh, peer health educators, or maybe there are other programs that are associated with the national office, uh, but that, that regular ongoing preventative education about substance abuse, about binge drinking, and about hazing uh, it is prominent. Yes, our office is um, is really involved with um, those courses that that Chris was just describing. Um, and not only do does that course have information about hazing, what it is, consequences, prevention, but it does also specifically have an alcohol education component to that course as well. And that is required for them to complete now before they can even go through recruitment. And again, for those who, who may not be familiar, um, Tulane does have a delayed recruitment process, which is, I think, a wonderful opportunity for students to get to campus, get acclimated, kind of get centered within themselves. Um, and also, too, to, to form genuine connective opportunities with fraternity and sorority organizations. Um, but once they are also newly affiliated members, those education requirements are still ongoing. And so one of the things, as an example, um, one of the things we are very busy doing right now is actually making sure our peer health educators are scheduled and ready because we know when we have, um, when we return for the start of the spring semester after break, we're going to have a lot of workshops that we are fulfilling for this exact purpose. I want to also add that workshops that I mentioned, like the buzz that just are offered to any population on campus that wants us to come offer that workshop, that workshop, when I say it's alcohol education 101, it does help students understand what is binge drinking. Because one thing that we know is um, this is a really exploratory time in life. And sometimes students don't necessarily know these terms, or maybe they've heard these terms, but it's been kind of, you know, glib or in passing, and they may not understand what behavior actually constitutes that specific term. Um, so we do a lot of just ongoing um, education uh, so that students kind of understand and even have language to describe what their relationship with alcohol might look like or, or experiences with alcohol might look like. Um, so all that just to say there is a lot of ongoing education um, in my office has a very close relationship with the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Programs. And we, you know, stay in touch and, and throughout the year. And, and we do a lot to kind of cross program and cross promote and, and make sure we're getting good, solid, again, holistic health and wellness education to all of our different um, campus populations. Thank you. The next question is, what is the university doing to promote healthy choices before it becomes a problem? 
since so much of the culture seems to revolve around drink. Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I think that's, uh, you know, what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's, uh, you know, what we're, we're all doing and part of what we're doing today, what you, what you've heard about is um, these, um, you know, comprehensive programs from different partners on campus to, to you know, because um, obviously uh, the culture of drinking are just, um, you know, excess is a, is a common theme across all colleges. It's not just, not just Tulane. Um, and it's, we get the, the job of trying to fill their news feeds with something different, some al something alternative, something that could be more uh, uh, healthier or preventative in some ways. And so, um, you know, some of the programming that comes through my office obviously is is preventative. It's not not just for folks that already may have identified themselves that have uh, prob problematic relationships. We have uh, students that participate in our meetings and our social events that um, are there to support other students, are there to support um, because maybe their family member or friends have had issues around substance and they're wanting something alternatively to engage with. Um, all of the, the Live Well huts and all of the programming that comes and prevention programming that comes through Chelsea's office is all dedicated to help try to impact the culture um, and to normalize um, so that it's it, it's okay to not know about things and to explore stuff, but also to reach out for help and that you don't have to engage in this behavior. And there is other things to do in college other than go to um, a darty, a day party, right? You guys know that know that uh, terminology and. Um, you know, just um, get to a place where you're uh, blackout drunk or unable to to function in some way. So we really, really want to try to engage that. And it's a lot of that through student led initiatives, because those are the things that, that students want to do and, and engage with. Um, Chelsea, if you want to add to that, you're, you're welcome to. Yeah, just to offer kind of a couple of specific examples that fall under what Jacob just described. Um, Two Saturdays ago, we partnered with an initiative here on campus called Tulane After Dark, um, and they do a lot of really cool programming. They do um, like trivia nights and popular movies and um, host a lot of accessible evening time programming in our LBC, so in shared common space. And um, we partnered with them to um, offer, offer an evening movie, but we also brought in... Um, an outside agency to come in and do, we were there to do some education, but they came in and offered students mocktails. So what was interesting about that experience, um, a lot of students, as we learned, they didn't know what a mocktail was. They didn't know that there was a zero proof beverage that one might purchase if you're of legal age and you're out in that social setting. Um, but let's say you want to find an alternative to um, alcohol. It was it was really very very interesting, and and we came up with this idea in part because we know that zero proof beverages are kind of in the health world having a moment. They're becoming really popular and vogue and and fun, and so we were you know trying to seize the moment and be cool and and offer something different, um, but also give them some skills that they could take with them beyond the movie program, right? Um, so if they are in a social setting and they're out with friends and they want to be with friends um and participate in in whatever they might be doing in that moment but they're still looking for a different option for themselves they would know what to look for how to even ask for that um again of course if they're of legal age and in an establishment that that serves alcoholic beverages um but that program was on a saturday night on campus to give them something else to do besides just going out um for for lack of better language um, so there are a lot of different specific programs that we're engaged in and trying to create spaces where students can have alternative programming. Another thing we did with our Tufts earlier this semester, it was also on a Saturday, but conversely, this was first thing in the morning. Um, we, you know, loaded up our 50 students and we went and did a swamp tour, um, which I wasn't sure if students would be excited about because some of these students have been in New Orleans for almost four years. Um, but I learned that day that even the students who had been in the city for years had never crossed the Pontchartrain Bridge. Um, and they got really excited and they were like taking pictures of the sunrise over the bridge. So um, just creating different opportunities for connectivity and community, because at the end of the day, I, I definitely think, especially this particular age demographic, 
that is what they are wanting as a part of their collegiate experience, that connection, that community, that kind of home base. And I'll just add that the Tulane After Dark series happens every week. And so the, the um, regularity of that, I think is also a really good support for students than they know. There's always a trivia game, you know, in the evening hours when other people are going out, there is entertainment that they can access that's really close by and it'll happen every week. So they've got this kind of, you know, standard kind of um, schedule you know, they'll change the movies every week and they'll add different things to kind of keep it fresh. But those are some things they can definitely rely on. And they transformed the space that they use for those this summer. And so it's a really, really comfortable, engaging, um, lovely space um, here in the Lab and Burnick Center. And it's so it's available late at night, but it's also available all day long. And so I think that even the fact that there's that great hangout space, it's called the um, the 1834 lounge, um, then that means that students can kind of get used to dropping by there just to hang out, to find community, to catch up with friends, but then also to participate in these activities. And I think that that sort of normalizes it for a lot of students too. So I would say, you know, check in with your student, ask if they've been going to that space or they've done any Tulane After Dark, you know, events. So that's something I would definitely want you to um, know about and encourage your students to utilize. Um, another question is, um, what housing accommodations can be offered for students to decrease their exposure to substances, including legally prescribed drugs or medications that are classified as controlled, for example, ADHD meds and cannabis? Can, you, can anybody tackle that one? I can, I can start and um, say, yeah, I mean, we, um, we're excited to be offering more housing opportunities in the near future with, um, you know, housing is, um, it, it can be difficult for folks. And I think a lot of times folks to um, learn a lot about their peers and their environment and what's going on when they get to live in the residence hall. Um, and, you know, our residence life folks do a, a wonderful job at accommodating and um, meeting people where they're at. I think if your student it feel comfort, it feels comfortable enough to talk to their RA or talk to the resident director um, about some of their concerns or some safeguards for themselves, um, we try to be as accommodating as possible. They've definitely worked with uh, our executive, executive director of housing, Tim Limford, um, and he is supportive of folks in all their individual needs. So if we have uh, a student that um, has some self-identified issues in some ways, and that is starting to come up um, in, you know, through um, their environment that they're living in, it doesn't seem like it's um, supportive for them. We can do our best to make some accommodations, to make some moves where we can. Um, but what's really exciting is with our so with our recovery community home that will be online next again next year. Um, eventually, we'll be offering recovery housing in that space, and that's you know for folks that are wanting to live in substance free housing or self identify as someone as a person in recovery and wanting to be in that space. So we're we're excited about being able to give that opportunity. And with our new residence halls coming online as well, we'll have more options for folks if um, their spaces are not um, conducive or supportive for their individual needs. Uh, folks can also reach out through Goldman, um, which is uh, the Goldman Center for Accessibility. And if they're having some, um, if they meet the qualifications for um, a disability of some sort, and especially if that comes up through, through the housing process, we want to be able to support them in their um, in what's best and most effective for them and their long term health outcomes. So it's a great question, and uh, we we will have more offerings to come. But as as it is stands right now, we absolutely want to be responsive to their needs um, and believe believe that we're doing so as our, as our students are are coming up with their individual issues. Another question is um, that. The parents are in recovery and their student is well aware of the dangers of alcohol and drugs but thinks that it's just not possible in New Orleans and in Tulane and even worse if they were in a fraternity um, to avoid those. And they said that while they're pretty practiced in al -Anon principles, they would welcome any advice on some low pressure talking points and you know ideas that you all might offer. So um, I think I'll throw that out and ask if that would be something that maybe um, Jacob or Chelsea could 
then to me to send in the follow-up email that I'll send all of the registrants um, yeah. just because we're running a little low on time right now. But I think that's a wonderful question. Absolutely. And Penny, um, if, I, if I can jump in just to sure. you know keep keep us on schedule though, I'll say it real quickly is that we have students that come. So one of the meetings that we provide is on Tuesday nights in Warren Residence Hall in um, Lounge 1 PS1. So it's in student spaces. Uh, we provide an all recovery support group and that's for students that identify that they're in recovery, but also has students that have family members that are in recovery or that are related to folks that may be in and out of, um, that maybe be struggling with addiction or substance use issues. So I would encourage them if they're open and available to one, come attend one of our meetings. They don't have to share anything. They come and listen. You can reach out to me anytime. And of course, we'll give you a, a, a more um, comprehensive response as well. But uh, we absolutely have students that are um, engaging in some of our recovery supports on campus um, that may be tangentially related to, to their own personal experience. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is that there's a really good resource on the Campus Health website that is a guide for our how to talk to your student about um, alcohol. And that is also linked on the family programs archive, webinar archive. So it's um, it's a really well put together you know, resource, several pages that has some of those talking points that you might find, find helpful. So I will also add that to the, the slides or um, to the follow-up email that I'll send. So that, that was a um, great question. So we thank you for asking that and we'll try to provide some more in that vein in the follow-up resources. So here's another quick question. Could you describe what a cessation kit involves, Chelsea? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our smoking cessation kits, they're pretty simple. They have kind of supplemental oral asphyxiation items. So again, a smoking cessation kit is going to be something that supports somebody who's desiring to either decrease the amount they're smoking. Um, maybe they have the eventual goal of quitting smoking altogether, but maybe they don't. They're just looking to modify how frequently they might be smoking. And a lot of times for um, people who have that kind of um, dependency, but also just like that practice of of smoking, whether it's a cigarette, vape, otherwise, um, replacing that engagement with something like a toothpick, like a mint, um, can be really, really powerful. Um, I don't mind sharing with you all. My partner, um, recently quit smoking and I thought we were going to personally buy all the toothpicks in the world. It's a powerful tool. Um, so it's got simple resources in there. It's also got fidget spinners, things that you can kind of, I'm sure you all have noticed, I talk a lot with my hands. Um, so sometimes providing people with tools to kind of put that energy somewhere else can be really, really helpful. And then also too, it's got information about if you are interested in accessing some of those resources that Jacob described, if you want to make an appointment with Student Health Center to talk more about um, possibly supplementing your efforts with any sort of medication or other tools or resources. It's got information about how to get further connected to actual smoking cessation programs. And we do from time to time offer them just where students can kind of take them, learn about them, but they are also often paired with additional education. So students aren't just like picking it up and they're like, what the heck is this bag of toothpicks with like a fidget spinner? Um, we make sure they understand like what they are and, and what they're purposeful for. So another question is, Forms have been signed allowing parents access to records. Where do we go or how do we see if there have been any problems? So that's I do that's actually clarify. that's an easy one. Well, I'll let that's Chris an easy one. That that, one. That's an easy one. Uh, one, if there has been a conduct problem and it's related to drugs or alcohol the, or a transport, the parent would have already been notified. And so using either the emergency contact information, including phone or email, we are allowed to send parent letters for violations of the drug or alcohol policy. So no news is good news in that sense. Um, the other easy answer is we do have some information about our records and, and in particular, the, the parents' right to access any educational record on our conduct webpage. So I would certainly encourage you to go view what's called our FERPA policy, Family, Family Education and Right and Privacy Act. Uh, and then lastly, if you have a question, it, you can always email me or call me at the Office of Student Conduct, and, and I can walk through and see what forms we have. And if we do have the appropriate forms, then I can we can walk through any record disclosure that we would need to do. Thank you. 
Well, folks, I, we have come to really the end of our time. Can you double check? Yes. And um, but we we answered all the questions that were here. I know there's some that we could send you some follow up information about. So please watch your email um, for that. Or if um, if you need to, um, you don't have the specific contact information for any of our panelists. You can always send that question to me at families at Tulane.edu, and I'm happy to forward that to the appropriate person. So I'm happy to do that for you. So um, again, this will be posted in, um, in the webinar archive. And if you have any feedback about the webinar, um, then you can send that to families at Tulane.edu as well. And I'll share that with our presenters, or if you want to type in something here before we close, and you have any quick comments, you're welcome to do that. We appreciate that. Um, and then if you have suggestions for topics for future webinars, I'm really happy to hear those from you um, to help um, set up our schedule for um, the future. So we had one last question. Where would a student pick up the smoking cessation kit? Chelsea, I'll throw that to you. So they can, if they're explicitly interested in that, come see us in the well. We're on the third floor of the Student Health Center. So if you just tell your student to get connected with Chelsea in the well um, on the third floor of the Student Health Center, happy to help get them connected. Okay. Well, thank you so much to my colleagues for your time this afternoon to um, and your expertise all the time um, to help our students um, in this area of their lives here at Tulane. And thank you to um, all of you parents and family members who joined us. We appreciate your um, interest and your involvement this afternoon and your support of your students always. So thank you so much. I'll close the webinar now um, and say thanks again. Goodbye.